live. All right, and hello, everyone, and welcome to Star Trek Fenrir, where everything is improv and the warp factor doesn't matter. Yes, the warp factor is like the Temporal Prime Directive. It doesn't mean a damn thing. For those of you that are new to the stream, uh, Fenrir is a tabletop role-playing game using the Star Trek Adventures rule set. We are set in Star Trek Online's canon, more specifically 2410, aboard a Cerberus class that is following in the footsteps of the USS Ophion. You don't need to have watched my old Ophion game to enjoy this one, though you might catch a few references and subtle nods if you do. And if you want to catch the VODs for either this or Ophion, you can find it on YouTube and most other popular podcast solutions. The last thing I have to say before I run the intro is that uh, whatever support you can provide, be it a follow, sub, donation, bits, patron, whatever, it's all greatly appreciated. Just make sure to take care of yourself first. So with that said, I'm going to run the intro and then we will dive into the game proper. So BRB. <laughs> And welcome back, everyone. Now, those of you that, uh, again, are new, uh, something I like doing for all my tabletop games is having an opening monologue that is read and or prepared by the players. And for Star Trek, you're probably already guessing this, but that means something like a captain's log. And tonight, the honor of that falls to Mr. Rast. So, John, if you would be so kind. Sure thing. <coughs> First officer's log, star date 87706.4. The recent visit from the Q being and this Santa Claus has, uh, a po has had a positive effect on the crew, and for this I'm generally thankful. What I don't appreciate is the four fucking hours I've spent removing all the gaudy decorations plastered all over my quarters. Computer, delete last sentence and pause recording. I mean, it's bad enough to be singled out by this being that has compromised my emotional state but to desecrate my quarters with this supposedly festive adornments is an unneeded burden. Arr! All right, computer, resume recording. Now, for the disposition of the older Azeth ship and its pirate crew. The pirates have been confined to the brig, and we'll be handing them over to the uh, once we reach the nearest starbase. The ship, however, presents a possible predestinational paradox. If what we understand about this vessel is true, and that it is truly a vessel out of time, I, re I regretfully requested Maddock explain the possible ramifications to me, but his explanation actually created more questions than it answered and contributed to the headache that I am currently experiencing. With the recent encounters of new silicon life forms and other unusual phenomenon, we've decided to engage further science officers, and I look forward to engaging with them. Maybe their explanations will leave me less, less perplexed and somehow less dirty feeling than when I, than when I get when I speak with Matic. Very nice. Thank you so much. And yeah, what we're going to do for our first scene is we are going to start with a senior staff meeting that includes our two newest players. And since we already know... Uh, you know what? In fact, let's just do a, a quick round table. Uh, if everyone could go through and introduce yourself and your character, and then we'll dive into the meeting proper. So why don't we start uh, with the captain and we'll work our way down based on chain of command. I am Captain Brie Archuleta. Um, I guess we're doing this in character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh I'm, I guess, from a star base, and uh, I welcome our new members aboard, or our new staff aboard the Fenrir. All right. Up next is Mr. Rast. Commander Rast sits up in his chair a little bit and tugs his shirt down and looks at the new, uh, new officers and says, I am Commander Rast, and uh, I am 
the first officer of this vessel, and he looks a little distracted. Um, he's obviously uh, at least you know he is obviously half Romulan, um, and something else, but it's kind of hard to tell just from appearances. Uh, and he uh, is not very clean shaven today. Uh, his hair is a little uh, messed up, and he just looks quickly to the next person. All right, that would be Mr. Williams. Hey, uh, Commander Williams, RJ, call me RJ, uh, when we're off duty at least. Uh, born on Tycho City, or in Tycho City on Luna. Uh, and welcome aboard, it's great to have you here. All right, and then we have Mr. Maddock. Um, Maddock is looking through uh, data pads and he just kind of, uh, Commander Maddock, Chief Engineer, temporal stuff. What? Okay. And then he goes <laughs> back to his pads. Williams is going to kind of elbow him. Come on. <laughs> what? Is it? Are you still giving me shit about not finishing the phasers? No, I don't care about the phasers. Be nice. It... Just say hello. Hello, I am Commander Matic. I'm the chief engineer. At this time, I'm busy trying to figure out how to not break the temporal prompt directive, even though I know I'm about to. And up next, uh, apparently we have a hologram who can't decide what rank his is, or maybe that's on my end. Either way. It just keeps, keeps flickering. Yeah, just yeah, like the, the pit flickers. <laughs> it keeps flickering. His rank is hologram. It's like a... <laughs> anyway, like a Dag, if you would like to introduce yourself. You are also muted. 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 <laughs> I am Lieutenant Commander Vassar, formerly an interactive research archive of the Vulcan Science Academy, commissioned in 2157, and this is my first Starfleet posting as a hologram. Very nice. And then last but not least, we have Mr. Tobin. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Lee, um, I'm the former science officer of the USS Tethys. It's a pleasure to be working with all of you. You notice that... Uh, his uniform is immaculately maintained. His pips shined. Everything is exactly uh, in accordance with Starfleet regulation, except for the uh, ornate Bajoran earring, which is still, I don't think, technically approved by the Starfleet uniform code. Mm, I don't know, 2410, it's probably up to captain's discretion. Hmm. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Captain. Of course. All right, and with that out of the way, you guys have a handout to role play with as much as you like. Uh, you know, Maddox and I have been studying this ship, the, the Proximo. Um, the technology level of the vessel is consistent with the time period they say they're from. Uh, the weapons are pretty archaic by our standards. Uh, I think if Matt, if you'd like to back me up here, I think we can more or less confirm the ship out of time hypothesis. Um, along with what Williams has said, along with the massive chroniton buildup, um, and with there being enough previous events in this area resulting from ships either going into or coming out of the uh, Tazarki portal. Um, I would probably say that it's a very large uh, likelihood um, along with what the as if had noted uh, the fact that the Proxima itself officially never experienced a temporal displacement um, yet everything we've given them as of now has them telling us this is the Proximo as if it literally came out of one of their shipyards and we happened to come across it. From what era do they claim to be? Uh, I guess you haven't been read in fully. Um, whenever they came through the portal from the Andromeda Galaxy, um, they came across a couple of unsavory characters who left them on a class L. 
planet. That class L planetoid, yes. Classoid planetoid, which is about a day at max warp away. Um, the th- and then uh, they pirated the ship where they then ran into us, and then the captain quickly surrendered after our captain showed a very brave face. Captain, if I may, Class L planetoids are barely habitable. Uh, considering the Azif are silicon-based life forms, uh, they might find it even more difficult to survive in that environment than one of us. I re- recommend that we uh, attempt to rescue them as quickly as possible. I agree with you. And uh, what, so, so out of character, the Proximo is still right by us, right? Uh, at the moment, you have it in a tractor beam. Okay. Is it possible to carry it with us? If you wanted to make it happen, we can do that. We At maximum exp- warp. We yeah. would have to expand the warp bubble, but it's completely plausible. Okay. I would like to carry it with us. So, illuminating suggestion, Lieutenant Lee. And let's do it. I would be remiss. <laughs> I would be remiss not to mention, and he's staring right at Matic. The pr- mm. the temporal prime directive would prohibit us from mentioning to this crew that we are going to find on this planet that we know of their race here in the future, and it also stipulates quite clearly, I might add, that we need to correct do our best to correct the time stream. Oh yeah, Maddie. that part <laughs> of the prime temporal prime directive. We have to fix this. Uh, yeah, if I remember... oh, yeah. oh god. Go if ahead. Remember... Yeah, if I remember my elementary temporal mechanics, um I mean, could this not be a predestination paradox? I've 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 used that argument way too much. I've used that argument way too much. <laughs> Kath has seen my files. Has seen my file. Rast has seen my files. Um, and then Maddie will just kind of like stare off into one of the corners and he's like, I really hope that I'm trying my hardest to not break the temporal prime directive. And I really hope that the current observer for this situation for my trial <laughs> um, does see me in a good light in an attempt to not break the temporal prime directive again well doesn't the prime directive in, encourage us or require that we fix the disruption so yes it, it requires us to fix the disruption however we've put everything back exactly the way that it was um let's say that i leave a hypo spanner let's say we leave a hypo spray let's say that we leave a piece of a piece of bacteria behind that's carbon based, that is not silicon based. That could completely change how that could completely change how this species evolves. It's literally the butterfly effect. Go back a million years, step on a butterfly, and humanity was never humanity never evolved. It's time paradoxes are fun. They're so much fun. You know, Mr. Maddox, I think we're just gonna have to do the best we can. Just watch out for any butterflies. Will do. It might help if I unmute myself. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off there, Dag. Uh, what I was going to say <laughs> is looking at character sheets, I believe, and it, we're going by the Bajoran, the first name is the surname, right? Yes. All right, so Mr. Lee, uh, if you would care to roll me a reason and science, and the difficulty here is only a one. And I will tell you, uh, based on your number of successes, hopefully, uh, what you have observed, <coughs> both of Matic and everyone else in the current situation. Okay. And again, this is mostly just to get you guys momentum and otherwise uh, get you accustomed to rolling. No, you're telling Hi. me that he's my prosecutor in my future trial. <laughs> <laughs> no applicable focus? Uh, I would say you actually have a focus. You uh, have temporal mechanics, so yes. that's a focus. Okay. And two successes, which means you start off with one momentum, and whoever nice. wants to keep track of that. 
Uh, so what you're realizing is that uh, sending the ship back is going to require a little creative use of the deflector array, but it's manageable. You know, assuming Maddox didn't do something to the EPS conduits again. Well, Captain, uh, if we invert the polarity of the deflector in order to create a subspace inversion, we should be able to affect a temporal schism in the portal to the Andromeda Galaxy, which will return the Azeth to their home time. Now, I would need to analyze the uh, chronometric signature that they're displaying individually and perform some work on their ship, but uh, it should be possible to return them. Uh, do you have an estimated time that this would take? Well, I, I think in the amount of time that it would take us to get to the planet where they've been uh, abandoned or marooned, recover them, um, and then run some scans on the journey back, I, I should be able to make those modifications to the deflector array within the next two days. All right, that sounds fine to me. Time is of the essence, obviously, in this situation, so. Commander <clears throat> Medic, um, what's your assessment of the uh, Fenrir's actual capacity to be modified in that way? Um, I would have to probably back up a couple of the secondary systems to ensure that they don't, um, that they aren't overloaded with chronotons and then uh, accidentally split the ship into multiple time zones. Um, the thing is, is that no matter how precisely we can, how precisely we're able to calculate this, uh, chronoton schism that uh, you plan on creating um, we would have to we would have to create this schism and then literally watch to see when the when the proximo enters it just so we could put them out at the same time that they exit it if we put them in a couple days early a week early and all of a sudden there's two proximos if we mm. do it too late and they're assumed dead, then all of a sudden they appear out of nowhere, like, it brings up too many questions. Well, I would hope that uh, Lieutenant Commander Bassar, given his extensive experience in this area, might be able to run those calculations. Um, he does specialize in temporal mechanics as well, I believe. That is correct, and I would be happy to facilitate your calculations. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. If we do find the time frame from which they are actually from, I might also recommend that we replicate Starfleet uniforms from that time. Um, the thing is on that is that the schism that we plan on creating will be in the portal <laughs> back to the Andromeda's uh, galaxy. And just so, so when once... they see, just so when they see us on the planetoid. They don't see futuristic. I mean, they're in I a mean, whole new galaxy. They're in a completely different galaxy. I don't see how they would really understand. But also, 300 years ago, that would put us at... You know, the time of the like founding of the Federation. 100, yeah. we wouldn't have even had... We would have... That's true. That, that would have been what? Inter NX Enterprise time zone. Mm -hmm. That so that would be the the year twenty one ten was approximately fifty years after first contact on Earth. Were we even about... in space then? So we're talking, we're or like were two we... to two point five. How about we don't pick an era? How about we just do this with no designations and no labels? So I feel that would be captain? prudent. Is that an agreement? Okay. We should also be certain to wipe their database to make sure that they don't bring home any information regarding scans of our ship or any of the areas in our galaxy. It's true. We may be able to set up a subspace dampening field maybe uh, around their hull. Their equipment's pretty primitive. I don't think it would take much to flood their sensors. Well, I was considering... Um... If at any time, I th whenever I take a team over there and we repair any systems that may have been damaged, um, that we do that we do a full uh, 
data download of their systems and then try to find a reset pre but that uh the computer would have a backup for before they entered the portal why would we need to download their data systems well it would be their data? we would i say download their data um in my opinion i believe that we should at least take star charts even if they are 300 years old it's still more information than what we really do have about the andromeda galaxy or its historical uh borders um and so we don't know what empires may have risen or fallen or <laughs> what dangers really lie beyond without knowing the history Pardon um me, but i feel obliged to point out that taking historical data from a ship out of time may constitute a violation of the temporal prime directive uh, that's <laughs> debatable we'll figure we'll figure well that'll get figured out in court um i mean, I, I, I tend to agree with you though Matic. Even just for the simple fact that if we download their database, their sensors may have passively picked up some evidence of the phenomena and may make it easier for us to recreate it. And Starfleet has permitted um, exploratory teams to use the Guardian of Forever to travel into the past for historical research. Um, this would be far less uh, destructive to the timeline than anything that they could have potentially done. The Temporal Prime Directive generally applies to uh, acquiring knowledge of future events rather than past events. So I do recognize that potential gray area, but it's worth consideration, at least. Lieutenant Commander, your opinion? I am inclined to remain neutral on this point. We can draw some historical parallels to the time traveling mission of the original well, rather the second USS Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not completely sold on copying their data, but Matic, if you can convince well, me by the time we get there, then. Re regardless, <laughs> I would say, let's say that I found a computer backup that occurred two days before they entered the portal. Um, all data from that backup it's a now that has been collected i would probably i would be deleted anyways i mean what's the what's to stop it from you know we come across the proximo as it is now versus as it is now 300 years old versus as it is currently beside us in our tractor beam but we would be collecting data about a galaxy we haven't explored yet is that right? It is. I mean, I've I went I was there for several months on the Lysithia. Lysithia, yeah. Yeah, I was there for several months with the Dacian Institute on the Lysithia. So technically, we've explored it. It would just be additional data that we could use um, to also somewhat map and chart how the galaxy may have changed. Uh, using the portal as a, ooh, what's the word I was looking for? Fixed point? Point of reference? Yeah, point of reference, <clears throat> fixed point. Either take your meaning. Of those terms would be nice, but, you know, if we're able to see that the entire area was mostly class Ys, now all of a sudden it's mostly class Ms, what happened in 300 years? Hmm. It would give us, it would give us an ability to know where to start instead of just hey that's a pretty star let's go that way you know but should the azeth find out about the acquiring of this data in the present uh it may very well affect any relations we have with them moving forward since we are just starting to build relations with them uh the i mean azeth before like Before utilization of it, I believe that it would be prudent to. I plan on keeping them in the loop. Um, I don't plan on going very far into detail about what we're doing, but I'm, you know, I feel that it's right for them to know, for them to have a basis of this is what happened, this is what occurred. So that way, if any historical changes do get made, um, the temporal uh, 
the temporal for the temporal adjusters know kind of where to focus on to try to fix things as opposed to just i bet the queen the herself in our current timeline could take uh, offense to us potentially taking data from her ship that she did serve on well she can't know that we've come across the ship right we've we've already been in contact with her yeah oh that's that's how it's been confirmed that this but is I'm the proxima this wrong well okay well go ahead, go ahead. what i was gonna say is captain as you review your mental notes um, there is a chime, and it is from the bridge, and the bridge reports, uh, Sir, you wanted to know when we were coming within range of the planet? Ah, yes. Uh, meeting adjourned to your stations, please. All right. And we are going to cut to the bridge. Yay, that sound effect's working today. All right, let me adjust for the stream. Uh, Matic, you're going to be at this back station today. All right, so uh, with all of you taking your uh, predetermined uh, seats on the bridge, uh, what you see on the view screen ahead of you is a immaculately uh, glittering planet that is amethyst in color, so sort of a rich purple. And it is literally glittering as if it were just a jewel that is sitting in space. And if you want to know more, it will require a roll, a sensor roll, or, you know, you could just put it on the view screen and look at it, whichever you guys want to do. I'm going to say on screen, but I also would like to scan it. Okay. So uh, the way this is going to work is uh, either Mr. Lee or Mr. Vassar, and I'm going to butcher the name initially, so feel free to correct me. Um, both of you uh, are going to either assist the other or so one of you is going to be doing the assisting. The other one's going to be doing the main role. Um, the role here is going to be a reason and science for both of you. And then the difficulty is going to be a one. I will assist. Okay. Reason, science, 2d20. No applicable focus, I would assume. Uh, well, so. try and sell me on one if you have one that you think would apply. Well, I'm scanning the planet uh, in order to, uh, I guess, detect the Azeth, who mm -hmm. are temporally displaced, and thus they have been suffused with chronotons. And so my temporal mechanics focus could apply. I'll give it to you. <sighs> Welcome to the Matic Bullshittery table. That's what we do. <laughs> we Here's have a card. Reason. Yeah, we do have a card. <laughs> That we hand out at the end of every session. Very nice. We are at three successes, four successes. So you guys get three momentum. And I'm going to give both our lovely holographic officer and our other Bajoran. Uh, both of you should now see a handout entitled Class L Planet Notes. And you two can disseminate that information as you wish. I don't know if you want to take this one or. You're muted. <laughs> I am still processing the abundance of data regarding the deuterium C's. Very good. Deuterium C's. Dang. Matic will just kind of look over. Uh, English? The planet is spectacularly uninhabitable for an L-class. Um, I'm detecting that most of the surface consists of crystalline deposits rather than uh, standard Earth. And uh, the seas seem to have extensive concentrations of deuterium. Uh, there's also evidence of habitation on this world, given that there are a number of small refineries 
on the surface. One in particular stands out. Um, both the temporal and regular prime directives may apply in this case. Um, Matic will, uh, he'll, oh, he'll, uh, hey, uh, Lieutenant Commander, um, you said it's uninhabitable. Um, sensors are set up for carbon. Let me include the, as the readings we know of the Azif. Um, that way we can, that way you cannot do a scan for the atmosphere based on silicone based life forms just to see if it may, just see if they may be habitable for them. And then Matic will adjust the sensors so that way they can scan again. Okay. Uh, I would say if you want to give me one momentum, I will answer the question or any questions you might have. Actually, uh, I forgot that science officers get a free question. So either Lee or uh, Vassar, you can ask a free question without having to spend momentum. I guess the most obvious question would be, do I detect the, uh, the presence of the Azeth? Would that be a question that you'd be comfortable asking or? That was actually the question I was going to ask is if we detected any chronoton discrepancies on the surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. So initially uh, what you're going to detect is that there is chronotons on the largest Island, the one with the refinery, the main refinery. Um, but for some reason, you're not able to penetrate into the refinery itself. Um, the ore of the the way that the refinery, what the refinery is made out of, how similar is it to the Azeth ships? If both you give the, me momentum, both the Proxima and the other one. If you give me a momentum, I will answer that. If I call that four for this session. So far mm -hmm. so that's fine with me yeah. so no what you're detecting is that this is carbon based this is standard sort of refinery construction for uh just a you know like a something you would see in the federation just across all the federation planets this is a quote-unquote standard deuterium refinery so this does not have any relation whatsoever to the azf uh lieutenant commander tobin um how long would we how long do you expect us to be able to survive on the planet should we decide to take an away team and is the can you tell if uh the refinery is operational or not well the planet is technically habitable. It's just quite foreign to, uh, or alien for us. Um, we could probably survive down there for an extended period. Uh, there's a, an oxygen atmosphere. So it would only be impossible to survive long-term given there's nothing actually edible on the planet. Um, May I also point out that my hollow matrix is capable of sustaining operation in a class L environment. Well, that's yeah. nifty. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Vassar, can you alter your appearance at will? You may be able to act as an advanced scout. If there are acceptable physical templates I can download into my program, I can adopt them. Very handy. It's just then, Mr. Williams, that you are getting an alert on your console there are two fighter craft that have emerged from behind a nearby planet and are headed in your direction at high impulse. Yeah. Um, Captain's two small strike craft moving to intercept. Uh, report from who? Do we know who they're from? That would be a reason and a security role on the part of Williams. And the ship would assist you with a sensors and security. The difficulty here will be, let's put it at a two. Okay. Um, do my, or does my focus in, say, shipboard tactical systems apply here? Can I get a read on what kind of weapons they're using if they're sort of like Thaleron based, Tachyon based? Yeah, I'll allow it. Okay. You said sensor security for the ship? You got it. Okay.
All right, I see two successes, which is all you need. So for, hi dog, how are you doing? Oh. Uh, <laughs> she just, you know, posts up over here and like, hey, pay attention to me. Uh, sorry, get distracted by the big fluffy thing. So uh, what you learn, Williams, is that uh, they are actually like old Maquis style fighters. Uh, so if you imagine like an old peregrine. Like a raider? Like a raider, yeah. Um, they are for for out of mechanic out of game mechanic purposes they are a scale one and you are able to determine that they have phaser cannons uh Kathy, they look like old maki raiders mm. shields impulse, up impulse capable phaser mm -hmm. cannons all right shields up and with that i'm gonna put us on this map just so we can get a uh, a view of what's going on here so there we go. So shields go up. And uh, immediately, uh, the port side fighter craft does fire a few warning shots. And you know they're warning shots because while they're aimed at you, they do not even graze your shields. They just sort of pass by. And then it is at that point that, Mr. Rast, you are detecting there is an incoming hail. Incoming hail? Uh, On screen? Audio. Audio only. And what you hear on the other side is a gruff voice that simply says, you are not authorized to be in this system. Please turn around and leave the system. Out of character, this is Federation space, isn't it? It is sort of. It's not technically claimed by the Federation, so it's sort of in a gray area. Okay. Uh... This is Captain Brie Archuleta. This is the USS Fenrir. On whose authority are you asking us to leave? The message repeats verbatim. I.e., please turn around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, at this point, Williams will look over at Lee and Vassara and say, Lieutenant Commanders, would you mind scanning for life signs? Need a life form song? Um, certainly. So I'm going to say that you detect zero life forms on either craft. Well, your intuition is correct, Commander. Uh, these are unmanned drones, it seems. Perhaps they are from the refinery below, warning us away from their operation. Can you track? um any kind of trail of where they came from i can certainly attempt to do so thank you all right so that is going to be and this can be i'll say one of you can do the and this is anyone on the bridge uh one of you can do the main role the other i'll allow one other assistant on this uh this is going to be an insight and con and the difficulty on this will be a two so um, whoever has that you may I'll take it. Take it? Yeah, nice. There you go. And who would be assisting Mr. Rast? Um, I will. Okay. Um, and, w yeah, oh, wait, I'm assisting. So focuses don't apply when you're assisting, right? Uh, focuses can uh, apply when you're assisting. It's only that you are limited to the one die the when one. you're assisting. Okay. Um, can my focus of helm operations... Um, help us to sort of determine or, or sort of triangulate their course. And in game, I will even say, um, these old Maki Raiders had pretty inefficient reactors. There was an oscillation of 0.03 in the, uh, in the impulse weight. It should be fairly easy to track. I will let it happen. And I will also use my helm operations focus. Go for it. All right, three successes from Rast. Insight and con. Cool. One D twenty with an applicable focus. And Unfortunately, nothing from Williams. But uh, Rast, uh, with three successes, you gain one momentum, and you are able to determine uh, the following information: there are approximately nine of these fighter craft, these unmanned fighter craft, uh, scattered throughout the system. You are also detecting what could be a larger freighter-sized vessel. And there's maybe about three or four of those signatures, but you're not able to get a specific triangulation on their position. So you're, you're seeing almost like sensor ghosts. 
Uh, he'll just pass that information on. Uh, can we tell if the larger freighter knows that we're here? Are we I picking would anything up? I would say if you give me a momentum, I can answer that question. You can have it. Okay. So sure enough, uh, when you go to scan uh, the, you know, the system, uh, one of the freighters does come around uh, into view on the view screen as it sort of leaves the shadow of one of the planets. And it actually hails you uh, on a separate channel than the one the drones are using. Audio only again, ma'am. Um, are the drones continuing to fire? Um, no, they're just sort of sitting there at the moment. Okay, they can hang out. Um, audio only, yes. Kicks on audio. And this time it's a much less uh, much less robotic sounding voice. Uh, it actually sounds like there's an intelligence behind it. And it simply says, Federation Vessel, you have uh, no jurisdiction here. Please uh, state your business. Hmm. Uh, our business is to um, rescue some of our uh, some Federation citizens who crashed on this planet. Roll me a presence and a command with a difficulty of two. Good question. Do we still have the Proxima with us? Uh, that is up to you. I would say you could either have brought it with you in system or you could have left it on the edge. That way it's not involved in any starship combat. Up to you guys. I would suggest that we leave it at the edge of the system. Uh, composure? I will give you composure. Don't do and that's command. 2d20, right? You got it. Okay. Do command officers get the free success on presence Ooh, command? Well, she, she does, does get the. Yeah, she does have augmented <clears throat> presence. So with right, the with the two successes, uh, the voice there's a pause, a noticeable pause, and then the voice says, "All right, I can assure you that our mining operation is legal. It does. We don't use slave labor, but in order to assuage your fears, I will connect you directly to the boss. Is this acceptable?" Um, you can let the boss know we're here, but I don't need to talk to him to get this done. Very good. And that channel closes. Uh, you are able to detect that the freighter is, you know, calming down to the planet and not even 10 seconds later, the planet begins hailing you. Um, real quick, Matic wants to do a, uh. He wants to see, because hearing the word boss and the way that everything is just kind of acting towards him, mm -hmm. um, he wants to do a check to see if this is syndicate related. Orion syndicate related. Oh, hmm. uh, because we did deal with Orion's and Ophian. You, you did. mean the Orion free merchants. <laughs> let's, uh, let's do this as an insight security. And I'm going to set the difficulty at a three. Can I assist? If you can explain how you're assisting. That's a great question. Uh, espionage. <laughs> um, you know, being able to tell the the way that they are, um, the way that they're distributing their forces, the way that they're communicating, the, just the temper and tone of the different uh, communications that we've gotten so far. Does it really appear that they're helping cover something up and with that explanation you may definitely assist um with the freighter having been converted maddox going to <clears throat> scan the uh scan the freighter and then um i would like to try to use the focus of prototype engineering um by then <laughs> having converted the freighter from a standard to <laughs> whatever it needs services the profits i'll let it happen sure all right uh, yeah, 2d20, and then he's giving me... So, let's go to after focus. Yes. Let's see, is there any bullshit I can pull real quick? You've already pulled I your mean, bullshit. Yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say. Is there more bullshit I can pull? Uh, I mean, you could spend is, a momentum. We have three. Do you have three Are momentum? Are you all cool with that? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Do it. Yeah. 
That's what it's there for. Well, no, I just don't want to spend it, and then, like, all of a sudden it's, oh, hey, combat, we're fucked. Ah. It's fine. We'll security. blame it on Commander three. Williams if we're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Four successes, and none from Rast. Yeah. So with four successes, you get one momentum back. And uh, I will say yes between the two of you, even though Rash, you didn't succeed, but you still have eyes on it. These are probably Orion in design or Orion in nature. Uh, this would line up with their standard deployment. So this might be an Orion operation. Um, Rast, you're an empath, right? Yes. Um... For the first time in all the time you've known Maddox, you feel a cold, murderous rage come over him. <laughs> okay. Like, Captain even I... whenever he straight up shot a zombie Vulcan, you didn't even feel this. <laughs> but this is this is something new. Uh, so before we open the communication line, uh, Rast will... Uh, Captain, um, Maddox and I believe that uh, the Orion Syndicate is involved here. Would you like me to put on audio only yes please then he turns it on okay and i'm gonna do my best ferengi impression which you know oh my god so <laughs> uh, ferengi has worked with the orion still <clears throat> so the a ferengi voice comes over the screen it's feminine in nature which i'm not going to try to replicate but <laughs> uh the voice says this and they say uh, this is Lashika of the mining consortium how might we be of assistance starfleet well, you can call your drone ships off, first of all. Ah, yes. I apologize for that. We have less than savory things in the local area, especially Tholians. Nasty bit of business. And uh, pretty much right before your eyes on the view screen, the fighter craft peel off and go back to hiding behind whatever planet they initially came from. Okay. So Bree is going to address this uh, Ferengi. Mm -hmm. It's a Ferengi female. Fer uh, Ferengi female, and if I forgot to drop it, her name is Lashika. L-I-S-H-K-A. Okay. Lashika. Uh, I'm, I'm totally aware of the unsavory sort around here. In fact, that's why we're here. One of our um, survey, experimental survey ships crashed on this planetoid, the USS Cryptoria, and we are here to retrieve its crew, and then we'll be on our way. Hmm. Going with a little stretch of the truth there. Uh, why don't you do a, another presence command? Uh, I am going to spend some threat to make it a difficulty three, though. Mm. Okay. I'm going to assist by helping read the empathic impressions that I'm getting with from the Ferengi. So uh, just as a reminder, I mean, it's a good idea, but as a reminder, Ferengi are immune. Ferengi are immune. Oh, that's true. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oops. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, okay. Instead, I'll just, instead, I'll just cheerlead. Oh, cheerlead. there you go. Yeah, all oh, cheerleading. Yeah, do it. Can I spend a momentum? Oh, for sure. Obviously, yeah. For three dice You're and can the... i get composure i will give you do you have deception maybe no mm, i'll give you composure but only this once and it's presence command presence command yep all right and will you give me behavioral analysis i will <gasps> okay so we got four successes on the table five yes. successes on the table actually six because you also have augmented so yes. that means that's six successes. It's three more than you needed. You're up to five momentum. And the Ferengi on the other end goes, Ah, well, I don't think there was any crashed ships in the area, but I do believe I know the kind you're talking about. Uh, perhaps you could come down and we could discuss it in person. Okay, that works for us. Very good. Send us am, your coordinates. I am doing so now. I look forward to seeing you and whatever personnel you wish to bring down with you. Thank you. And then transmission cuts off. Bree's not going down there. 
Uh, Maddox stands up and he, Captain, I'll, I volunteer to go down there. Rast, you still feel, you still have the same feeling from him that you had earlier whenever y'all both confirmed it was Orion. I believe that, uh, I believe that our engineer may be emotionally compromised in this particular situation, ma'am. Hmm. Bree, uh, Here's what Rast says and stands from her seat. She walks over to Maddox and lowers her voice. And she looks at him sincerely and says, you have something you want to tell me? Um, it's in the file, but uh, after Wolf 359, whenever I was placed on the USS Sortius, um, the Savia of this universe was part of an away team with myself on a search and rescue. It was an Orion trap. Uh, she was killed while on the ship. Um, I proceeded to kill three Orions immediately afterwards. And ever since then, I've kept the blade and I still hunt. It's, I've seen counselors for it. I've tried to do a lot, but there's just the human nature that doesn't allow me to fully forgive. I, I can keep saying, I can keep everything in check. I can do my job, but when shit hits the fan, I know how they fight because I have fought a lot of Orions. Well, I can't deny that your previous experience worries me, but that means you have experience. And maybe this will be a chance for you to start healing. So I'm sending you with rest. Yes, and you're going to keep an eye on him, Commander. Yes, Captain. Any other volunteers? Uh, I would very much like to join the away team. Um, if the uh, Azeth are being held and possibly used as slave labor, then uh, a medical professional would be necessary. And my former experience as a chief medical officer would probably come in handy on the surface. That sounds good to me. Because of the environment and the situations that we may find ourselves in that will be less than habitable, I would uh, appreciate if the hologram was to come with us. Vassar, what do you think? I will do this. All right, you're in. Williams? Captain? Do you want to with, stay or do you want to go? I mean, <laughs> with the possibility with the possibility of conflict here back at the ship, I would be remiss in leaving you without a exceptional con officer. All right, you can stay with me. All right, we'll play some cards or something. <laughs> nice. So then, my uh, my question for both the captain and Williams: uh, Which supporting characters, if any, do you want to bring along? Ooh, One of the first times Rast has directly complimented Williams. I know it's so upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to take a well, and she is a medical officer, so that should go well with the former chief or the former CMO experience. Okay. So that'd be good. And Mr. Williams? Uh, I think I will Jensen. take... No! no. <laughs> um, yes. That's that's really kind of funny. Uh, I am going to take... Uh, you know what? Jensen. Jensen. All righty. You're playing Jensen? going to play Jensen. All right. So... Jensen's the ship's hypochondriac, by the way, for mm -hmm. those that uh, do not know. And I do expect uh, Williams to play on that <clears throat> angle tremendously. Yeah. I apparently Vulcan Nick pinched him one time as a human. 
He's never what? let go. Did, did, didn't okay. Happen. Didn't happen. <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> oh dear. All right. So next I question I have: um, Are you shuttle crafting down or are you beaming down? If that's. Anyone yeah. have recommendations on that? Who amongst us is the best pilot? Well. <laughs> <laughs> rest. Rest will raise his hand. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What if you say, Commander? Uh, may can Vassar use uh, his uh, neural interface with the ship to review the sensor logs to see if, if the fighter crafts um, uh, are able to be disrupted if they're piloted remotely? Hmm, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I would say if you give me a momentum, I will answer that question. Um, I have a question regarding that, actually. Well, let's resolve his question, and then we... Well, no, 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 it, it, it may save us from the momentum. Okay. <laughs> I told you, I got bullshit, I got bullshit to do. All right. Bullshit for days. Mm -hmm. Um, Matic did create a drone ship on the Arcadia, as you recall. I do remember, yes. Could uh, Matic just kind of, oh, that's what you want to know? Here's my research on using on my creation and usage of a drone ship. Perhaps we could use that and find similarities and similar uh, signals. I'm going to say that it's still going to be a momentum cost, but I'm going to give you additional information. I'm good with it. Everyone is good with the momentum. Yes. How many momentum do we have? Five, five right five now. Moment. It so caps above at my, six. So above right. uh, my name on roll twenty, you have like the four. Then you have the Starfleet symbol. That's our momentum. <laughs> Understood. All right. So to answer your question, there, uh, Vassar, um, there is a potential for disruption. Uh, more specifically. Um, if you were to send out a very strong theta band pulse, that would disrupt the communications between the planet and the craft. Now, because Matic is maybe adding his additional insight, what you would know is that these are the type of fighter craft that if they lose communication with their home base, they are still able to operate, at, albeit at a reduced capacity meaning that they probably resort to simple friend or foe type programming. Captain, it may be of some importance to know that the ships can be disrupted with a theta band pulse from the deflector dish, which will reduce their capacity to attack should they intercede while we are on the away mission. Okay, great. Send the specifications to Williams. Sent. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And I tell you what, uh, we are an hour in, so why don't we take our first break here? So we will be back in about 10 minutes, everyone. So BRB.
on the main overlay. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are a minute early, but uh, got a lot of content, so let's see what we can do. So if I understood correctly, you are all taking a shuttle down, and we're going to sort of gloss over it, but something very important does happen during your flight down. Of course it does. No, that no, <laughs> wouldn't be me without some kind of event. Does Rast crash? No, Rast does not crash, uh, though his piloting is put to the test because as the shuttle descends into the atmosphere of the planet, a violent storm does kick up. Now, it's not, it's not anything Rast can handle. Um, it's not so, something I'm going to require a roll for. Um, but what I will say is there is an event where everyone except v Versar, all of you that are on the, on the away mission besides our holographic individual, all of you experience at the same time different visions. So all of you have almost like vivid hallucinations or some form of out-of-body experience. Uh, you all experience it at the same time. And I'm not going to go individually through each of you because I want you guys to role play it out. But each of you is re-experiencing a moment in your life that really defined who you are as a person today. So that's why I asked if Lee had an orb experience, because that that might be one of them. Um, but all of you experience this, and this maybe takes all of five seconds of real time. So Versar, you're sort of sitting there, and you just see sort of everyone go like glassy-eyed and remain rigid for about five seconds. And then they all come back to themselves. Would I be able to get a xenobiology check? Uh, during that time, yes. If you want to roll me a reason medicine, please, at a difficulty of one. Also, Matic, I have noted your PM. Uh, dice pool two and uh, focus being xenobiology. You got it. Yes. All right, so no successes there means that, unfortunately, you're, well, maybe good or bad. You're not detecting any uh, foreign pathogens or any foreign material that has come into the shuttle. Intriguing. Mm. When Rast comes uh, to his, his knuckles and his fingers are just white from gripping the gripping the uh, gripping the the yoke or just in general just gripping onto objects mm -hmm. mm. LL is smiling and she has tears coming out of her eyes uh, Jensen is sort of in a sitting fetal position uh, with his knees up to his chin <laughs> Just gripping tightly, going, we didn't know. We didn't know. <laughs> Jesus. You may have a momentum. Continue the... Oh, nice. Yay. Continue, continue the Jensening. I find it amusing. <laughs> uh, Lee, uh, very briefly, makes that Bajoran gesture to indicate that he is praying, so the hands out towards the sides closes his eyes just for a moment and then he turns over to Jensen and takes out a medical tricorder and just gives him once over to see if he's all right okay he's fine Jensen is fine and Jensen is just shaking his head he goes no Jensen nothing... is never fine <laughs> there's nothing you can do there's nothing you can do I know the signs I know the symptoms it's it's, it's straight it's a textbook case right out of the most recent edition of the Packland Scientific Review it's cellular on UA. Alel's going to lean over to Lieutenant Commander Lee and just be like, ignore him. Uh, He's all fine. All right. I, I'm not detecting anything wrong with him. Um, maybe we should beam him back to sickbay. Are you sure That's about that? That's why it's so insidious. You can't detect it with tricorders. You know, tempting. Very tempting. <laughs> um, not my call, though. <clears throat> Uh, Commander Gen West. Jensen, are you fit to continue? I'll stick it out as long as I can, sir. Very well. But just do me a favor. When it gets too bad, just leave me. Don't have, you have watch. You have no my word. No problem. Don't tempt me with the good time. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, we will purposely find a reason to leave you behind <laughs> at this point, Jensen. <laughs> I appreciate I that, not. Commander, but just stop trying to make me feel better. <laughs> Jensen, I'd like you to forward a copy of this pack-led medical review, was it, uh, to me when we get back to the ship. Would you mind doing that? I, I wouldn't mind at all. If, if I survive this trip, we make it back in one piece. And if we don't, I'll bequeath you my entire collection of the Packlet Scientific Reviews. They're, they're fascinating. Um, I'm sure that I'll find those useful. This, it, uh, the tagline always caught me, you know? The Packlet Scientific Review. We find things that make us go. Have you ever actually met a Packlet? No, but I hear they're very smart. Isn't the Packlet Review? <laughs> were sponsored by the soulless minions of orthodoxy. They they propagate That's, the theories of cellular ennui. Those are those are libelous claims that have never been substantiated. Understood. I'm just dying on the inside here. I love it. <laughs> um so that all happens. That all happens and is true. Uh but the rest of your shuttle ride, uneventful. Uh, you eventually arrive on this screen, and I'll describe it for my audio listeners We, in a we did not take uh, Mama Bear's uh, good shuttle. Okay. <laughs> Has been noted. So as the shuttle comes out of the cloud layer and starts to descend towards the coordinates uh, you were given, you see on one of the larger crystalline outcroppings of the sea... Uh, sort of a large deuterium refinery and the weather is pretty hellish. The waves are violent. The crystalline sort of waves are smashing against the shoreline and it's, you know, kind of almost like a mad scientist in a, in a, in a thunderstorm type feel that you're getting. Um, but the coordinates are true. They lead you to a, a shuttle pad where you see, despite the inclement weather, there is a Uridian there waiting for you. And when you all step out of the shuttle, uh, the gentleman, the Uridian, uh, introduces himself and he says, uh, My name is Vol. I am Lashika's assistant and I will be taking you to her directly. Very well. <laughs> all right. So uh, he turns and doesn't even check if you're following him. Like, he just expects that you will. And the reason for that is once you are inside... We locked down the shuttle. Okay. Uh, once you are in the refinery, or at least within an enclosure, uh, what you realize very quickly is that not even 10 paces inside is that there are two security refin uh, two refinery security members... Uh, that have sort of fallen in behind you. Now, they're not being aggressive, uh, but you do, would all note that they do have disruptor pistols on their belts, and they are Orion, so Matic might have some difficulty here. And what I'm going to say, Matic, is while you are on this planet, you have an increased complication range that is going to be 3, so a 17 to 20 oh. for Matic. But uh, the good mm. news, again, is that they're not being violent or aggressive. And all of you are led through the refinery. And uh, what... Oh, go ahead. Real quick. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you said that they're Orion. Correct. Are they just standard, like, fucking... They're Orion, like, mercenaries, da 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 mm -hmm. Or is their symbolism, is there reason to believe that this is, like, syndicate? This isn't Ferengi mining business. Ferengi mining exchange, this is syndicate business. Uh, I would say they, they don't bear any insignia of the syndicate, but they are Orion in the nature that they are probably like mercenaries or other sort of uh, free, what's the word, free uh, free agents. Point of clarification. You mentioned there would be a three-point uh, complication range. Oh, yes. So what okay. that means for Matic is uh, when I he am, rolls... I... I understand what that means. I was okay. just, would that not be 18, 19, and 20? You're right. Thank you for correcting me. I can do math, apparently. No, I just want to give my boy a chance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 
with that all handled, um, you are led down a set of stairs and you emerge into uh, something interesting. Um, again, from the the uh, from orbit, you weren't really able to get a view of the refinery, but now that you're in it, uh, what you're emerging into is almost like a promenade on a starbase. Uh, it is almost an open air market where you're seeing taverns, you're seeing gambling, uh, you're seeing uh, restaurants, and what those of you of the higher Starfleet ranking, so Rast, Matic, uh, what you would note in particular is that everything is on just this side of legal, meaning that you could probably find something illegal if you went really looking, but for the most part, everything seems to be all right. Um, but the other thing you would notice, and this is a collective notice, is there are a lot of workers here. In fact, you're looking at close to about 1,500 workers, uh, all of which are from varying species in the Alpha Quadrant. But important, and I know this was a question coming up, you are not seeing any Azeth among them. Um, knowing Fringy, or ha being judged because this is 2410, um, mm -hmm. and with Fringy being more accepted into the Federation itself. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that like gives signs that are these indentured servants? Are these people here of their own free will working here? Are they slaves? <laughs> I'm trying to feel out their indication or anything moves. like that. All right, so Ra you're doing that. Ras is doing that. Uh, why don't we have? Rast, roll me a insight and uh, let's do command for you. Insight, command for you. Difficulty two. For uh, Matic. Matic will go for trying to find like uh, because the Orions did have those uh, fucking what were they called? They used them on their slaves to kind of like you had free will, but if you fucked up, it you know mm -hmm. that thing. He's trying. Uh, he's trying to search for that thing on anybody. I know the one you're talking about. It's it's like a bolt in the back of the neck. Yeah, um, it's the one that was in Enterprise on the Vulcan. Whenever when she got captured. Expense. Her and Trip. I think so, yeah. Um, okay, you will also roll, uh, but you're going to be an Insight Engineering. And but the difficulty for the two of you is a two. One of us is an assistant. The other, these are two completely separate roles. These are completely separate roles. <laughs> and while they're doing that, Jensen's going to sort of sidle up to. I'm going to go ahead and spend a point. Okay. Yeah, do it. So Jensen's just sidling off. It just go up to LL. Just, you know, Lieutenant. We have to be very careful on this planet. All this different alien food. You never know what it may carry. It may even be as bad as interspatial parasites. Mm. Don't tell me you're worried about Orion pheromones. There's that too. Oh my god. If we encounter any Orion females, I will be sure to alert you, Captain. I'm allowed. <laughs> Obviously, no I'm kidding. Obviously. <laughs> it's okay. It's an um, she's mistake. like... Whoops. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's a denobulin. So she's very familiar with hair moves as well. But she's just going to kind of roll her eyes. Like, I think we're going to be fine. And on that note, so Rast, you do gain a point of momentum, which brings you to your cap of six. Oh, uh, and... no, it brings us back to five. Oh, back to five? Okay, I wasn't sure if you added already. Um, yeah. So what you find out from the emotional state is twofold. Um, is the general feel from the people around you. They are pretty much here of their free will. They're not super happy to be here, but it's not like they are uh, feeling depressed, feeling trapped. Um, <laughs> they are just people trying to get by. Um, but the second part to this is that you remember that feeling you had when the um, the whole Vulcan, you know, the Vulcan zombie thing, and you felt that overwhelming presence? It's not as pronounced here. In fact, this is more of a whisper in the back of your mind. And 
there's just this this pressure, like an omnipresent pressure in the back of your mind that you're just now noticing. He'll sigh and continue. Okay. So unless well, I also have to point she's out she's gonna that... look around and be like is anyone else anyone else feeling kind of weird? She takes her tricorder out and scans herself. Alel, I think we all feel fine. And he's like a, looking at the hyperventilate. <laughs> and Maddie just he's like, Jensen. Jensen? <laughs> Jensen. This is it. It's the big one. She's scanning. Okay. Uh I would and like, then... uh, let's have you actually roll for this. Uh roll okay. me a reason and uh, medicine here. Okay. Um forensic science. Yeah, sure. Yes. Ooh, so good news, bad news. Good okay. news. Uh, you are able to determine that as long as you remain within the refinery, uh, there is actually a triox compound in the air. So you could conceivably remain in the refinery. Hmm, excuse me. And be fine. You could live here for an extended time. Because again, planets class L, you need triox to live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bad news. When you scan, what happens is the uh, lights that are in the refinery, at least in the section where you are, uh, they begin flashing red. And everybody in the area immediately kind of looks in your direction. And the security personnel uh, that are following you kind of, they don't go and fully plot their disruptor pistols, but their hands definitely go to it. And uh, an alarm begins sounding, and Vol just kind of looks around, sees that you've pulled out a tricorder, rolls his eyes, uh, goes to his wrist communicator and goes, turn off alarm on section 6, beta 9, uh, false alarm. And the alarms turn off. And Vol says, I would ask that uh, you not use your scanning equipment while in the refinery. We have very sensitive equipment that uh, your scans could disrupt. Hmm. Sure. She says slowly pocketing the medical tricorder. Mm -hmm. She's like, Commander. <clears throat> I have some news. Um, oh. There's a triox. You said triox, right? Triox. There's a triox compound in there. Really nothing to worry about. We're safe, but it's abnormal. So just thought you should know might be that weird feeling also to counteract the effects of the well let's continue yeah let's <laughs> so it doesn't are... isn't oh go ahead isn't excessive exposure to triox tantamount to uh, i mean slowly slowly being poisoned could we not go into cytotoxic shock no it unpoisons you it makes you completely healthy. In fact, by the time you leave here, you'll be completely cured of all your ail ailments. Oh. Well, how come right, this is Lieutenant how Lee? Lieutenant Commander Lee? Yes, that is absolutely <laughs> the case. Ensign, um, I, I have done extensive studies, and I believe that now that I think about it, I did discover an article in uh, the Sheliac Medical Review Journal. <laughs> that uh, indicated that triox compound has a, a, a tremendously positive impact on uh, the, uh, the human respiratory system. So you will be more than fine. In fact, uh, you should actually uh, take up some cardiovascular sports when you return to the ship. Uh, your, your lung capacity will be increased by at least 10% due to this extensive exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this... ever played spring ball? Yeah, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Lee, are you a doctor? Uh, well, I was. Yes. And he just sort of just looks over at Alel and just comes up to you and says, after this is over, I want to talk to you about switching doctors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what have I got? <laughs> and on that horrific note, as Lee faces <laughs> his life choices, uh, we skip ahead just a little bit. Uh, eventually you're led out of this sort of promenade area in the refinery into what appears to be a series of offices and the maze of hallways you're led through. You eventually emerge within a lavish dining hall that would be pretty much 
I'm trying to figure out how to put this bluntly. If you know the Ferengi, um, what's the word for it? You know how the Ferengi have, what is their afterlife? Their, um, the great treasury. Or yeah, yes. Treasury. The grand great treasury. treasury, great treasury, whatever it is. <laughs> um, it, the dining yeah. room divine is treasury. divine treasury. That's what it is. Um, the dining room is the most gold plated, most resplendent dining room you have ever been in. And it is just so high class that it's almost obscene how almost snooty it all looks. Um, but waiting for you at the head of this grand dining table is uh, what you would probably guess is Lashika. Uh, you're guessing this because uh, she is a Ferengi, uh, but also because uh, she does appear to have on very fine clothing. Um, ones that would be befitting of a daemon, actually. And uh, as you come in and Vol says, uh, your guests, uh, Madame Lashika. And Lashika rises and says, ah, oh, yes, come, come sit. I've, tr or, right, Frankie, right. yes, come, come sit. I've tried to uh, arrange a, a meal in your honor for uh, this great visit from the Federation. Please come sit, sit. Rast will take a seat. Basar will take a seat. Okay. LL is muted. OL will follow. Okay. Sorry. Basically, everyone sits down unless yeah. you tell me otherwise. Yeah. No, um, uh, Maddox won't sit. Maddox will not sit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maddox remains looming in the back. So, <laughs> the uh, Lashika uh, does sort of smile at everyone, even Maddox, and says, So, um... Where to begin? Uh, you were looking for someone. Perhaps I can help with that. Uh, do we know how many crew were on the ship? Uh, approximately 130. Yes, we're looking for approximately 130 crew members. I see. Uh, what species are they? Don't pro prime directive, can't tell you. <laughs> she gives you one of those smiles where she's like, I understood the words you just said, but I have no idea what they mean. Snake people. And she she thinks for a moment and says, snake people. I don't think we have those here. No, wait, wait. We do have a few. Can we guesstimate how many people or like, is there anything from the Proximo that would have told us how many a few might be? Well, if you ask Lashika, she could probably tell you. Well, there were 130, supposedly. Oh. Okay. So. Well. Okay. Okay. I guess I missed that. So then. 130. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking for 130 of those. 130. Uh, no, we have five that I can think of. Can we speak with them? Uh, see, that is. A sticking point, actually. Um, before you arrived, they went on a mining expedition deep within the ocean, and they have not returned yet. Convenient. They How would have been ago? left here a day ago. The Proxima would have left them only, at this point, 28 to 32 hours ago. That's odd. So it would be about 48 hours ago. That's that's very odd. They they have been with us for a month. It doesn't matter. They probably have, you know, the deuterium bins. Is there out of character? Is like the time travel slash Milky Way effect or something? Like physically, is there a chance like LL could deduce that that? <laughs> Like might be physically hurting them or killing them. Um, you can roll me a reason medicine difficulty of three. Feel free to use a momentum. Yep, do it. Okay, I momentum. will. I will. Um, <laughs> forensic science. Mm, sure. <clears throat> 
That was a gimme. Yeah, Damn so it. with one <laughs> success, unfortunately, no. But mm, passing thought. Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh fun. oh go ahead. Sorry, it's also possible that these are just uh Azeth from our contemporary period rather than those who have traveled through time. That is possible. Um we might want to ask for an image if they can provide us with them of the workers they're talking about. It also could be a completely different species. They could be Soleil. Do you have a worker file? Do you have moment. a personnel file? One moment. And she motions at Vol, and Vol kind of excuses himself from the room for a moment, and maybe you enjoy some rather exotic food that you weren't really expecting on a backwater planet like this. But uh, Vol comes back with a pad and uh, shows you all an image. And it is, in fact, uh, in Azeth. Uh, it has the same sort of snake lower half, humanoidish uh, upper half, uh, with the multiple arms, uh, and you're pretty sure that they're contemporary as it because if you recall session one, um, they all wore a very distinctive set of armor. Um, you're seeing that same sort of armor here. Yeah. I do not believe that these are the Azeth we are looking for. Don't they have a very specific biology that we could scan for? They are silicon based. And they should also be suffused with chroniton particles. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If we scan for those, um, Lishka, I understand that you are running some sensitive machinery in this installation. Uh, could you provide us with any more information regarding the frequencies on which it operates so that we could modify our equipment so as not to interfere with it? Ah, well, that would be very simple uh, if I truly understood it myself. Uh, of course, a, a good Ferengi delegates, but uh, I can certainly see what we can do. And she motions at Vol, and Vol again rolls his eyes and leaves the room. And uh, once Vol has left the room, uh, she kind of leans That's good. In. I was just about to say that delegate us an answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Lashika leans in and says, A wise woman can hear profit in the wind. Ferengi rule of acquisition number 22. I see that this is perhaps important to you. Would, uh, would there be any latinum involved if I were to assist you? There would be living involved and... Maddox's just staring at the two of <laughs> <laughs> He just kind of uh, says it offhand, like, uh, he, like yeah. it doesn't even register that he says it. Oh, no. And Lashika, for her part, doesn't miss a beat. And she just gives you one of those toothy Ferengi smiles and says, ah, then Ferengi rule, Ferengi rule of acquisition number 62. The riskier the road, the greater the profit. We can also pass on information to... Starfleet, that we examined your operations here and found that they were quite legitimate and properly run. That would be acceptable. And it's at this point that Vol comes back and he hold, he sort of is holding the pad and he's like, who do I give this to? Point to uh, Lee. Okay. Hands it to uh, Lieutenant Commander Lee. And, uh, Lee, I'd like you to roll me a reason engineering, please. Difficulty of two. You can do it, Lee. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so... Go ahead and use, uh, go ahead and use the momentum, too, so you get three dice. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was reason and what? Engineering. Engineering and... Um, can Jensen attempt to assist? So If you tell me how Jensen is assisting. Um, so he's attempting to... Sorry, he's attempting to take readings. <coughs> Basically, uh, the, the, the pad the, is... The equipment? Yeah, yeah, the pad is containing supposedly right. the frequencies you could scan on without disrupting the equipment. Okay. Um... Can I use Jensen's uh, either uh, power systems or power supplies uh, focus or antimatter technology focus if if the reactor for this facility is antimatter based? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So yeah, go ahead and roll me an assist. You're rolling reason and engineering as well. Just need to get one. 
engineering. 1d20 with a focus. Well, Jensen, two successes. I You're love nice. you. Nice. Good job, Jensen. I'm telling you, Jensen is worth it. He really is. <laughs> he is, yeah. All right, so I believe you get uh, one, two momentum. I think it's, I said because it was difficulty three, so you get one momentum. Um, so what you, together, what Lee and Jensen learn is interesting. And by that I mean is that initially um, you're sort of looking at the, the scan readings, and it's true, there is some sensitive equipment being done here. But there's an oddity there's too much equipment for a refining operation of this magnitude. And as you look, as the two of you look at this information further, you realize that either this operation isn't profitable or there's something more at play here. I would relay that information to Commander Rest. Okay. And uh, as I sort of mentioned that to him, and then I'm going to turn back to uh, Lishka and uh, say, well, I greatly appreciate you providing us with this data on your operation. Uh, you have uh, once again reaffirmed rule of acquisition 98 that every woman has her price. She just, she gives you a very appreciative smile and says, ah, you are familiar. Yes, I have become familiar with uh, Grand Nagus Rom's revisions uh, to remove some of the sexism inherent in the uh, rules of acquisition. Hmm. Well, Rom is doing Rom things, but he's doing good work. I can't deny that. And I will say, uh, you, since Lee was the lead on that role, you can't ask me a free question. At least I'm pretty sure that's how it works, but... Um... Based on the other equipment that they have here, can I extrapolate as to what it might be used for in combination with the other material that they have? Yes, and since it's your free question, your immediate thought based on the fact that there is a Ferengi here and based on the equipment readings you're seeing, they're probably also extracting latinum. Hmm. And as a reminder, all of this is coming from the planet's oceans. Mm. Can deuterium be synthesized into latinum? Um, no, uh, at least not according to my research. So for the less Trek inclined out there, um, deuterium is important because it is one of the materials used in antimatter reactions. So it is an important substance, and... It is something you would have a refinery on a planet like this because deuterium is usually profitable. Um, latinum, on the other hand, again, for those who are not Trek inclined, latinum is sort of like the gold of today's world where it is a extremely rare substance that actually carries a sort of monetary weight um, amongst the galactic community, which is kind of weird because Star Trek goes on about how they're a... Uh, a post scarcity, not like monetary based society, but then you are introduced to the Ferengi on DS9 and Latinum, and it's like it's it's worth a watch if you get a chance. Look at one of the episodes of DS9 where it's a a quirk episode. You'll you'll get a sense for what I'm getting at here. But end of the day, as I said, they're probably extracting Latinum out of the oceans as well. Well, with these uh, additional, in with this additional information, we should be able to run our scans and our search for the missing crew members that we are looking for. I appreciate your time. Of course, and feel free to use our facilities as you wish. And unless anyone stops her, uh, she actually rises, gives you all a courteous bow and a hand gesture, and excuses herself. Um, as for Vol, Vol sort of steps back, uh, remains in the room, but is often like a dark corner somewhere looming. So probably him and Maddox are in opposite corners, staring at each other menacingly. I think, I think she's invoking rule of acquisition number 239 here. Never be afraid to mislabel a problem. And I was just thinking of rule of acquisition number 194. 
It's always good business to know about new customers before they walk in your door. Am I the only one here that doesn't know Let's, the acquisition? Let, let us go ahead and <laughs> adjust our scanners and start searching for the as if before we uh, all become Ferengi. <laughs> Very Which well. I guess is then, rule of acquisition 284. This, Deep down, everyone's a Ferengi. Mm -hmm. All right. Speak for yourself. But what if we get an intron virus? We could actually become Ferengi. Benson, help with the scanner. Hi, <laughs> <Yes>, sir. <laughs> all right. So uh, with all of you scanning, I'm just going to give you this information free. There are traces of the as if having been here but you can confirm what, what what your ferengi host has said is that they are not currently present anywhere within the refinery great any, any traces of chroniton particles in the refinery that i will <clears throat> uh require a roll for um so <clears throat> among all of you one person can roll a reason science and one other person can assist with a similar reason science. And if you have temporal mechanics or temporal cords or anything temporal, that would apply. Uh, this is going to be a reason and science. And the difficulty I'm going to set at a four. Uh, all right. Sara, you might want to. Uh, I, I would take appreciate. Lead on this. I would appreciate taking point on this. OK, go okay. for it. I will assist. Are you spending any momentum for additional dice? I think you should spend a total of, what, three? For it two would be, dice? Three yeah, for three two for two dice. dice. Um, even though I'm assisting, given that this is analysis of chronotons related to uh, them, mm -hmm. would my talents of, um, what was it? Testing a theory and theory into practice, could I offer that bonus to him? Uh, no, but it, well, let me let me remind myself what your talent does. Let me take a look. Uh, let's see. So the testing of theory would apply to you, but you're assisting, so your die doesn't do anything. But with your theory into practice, it does bring the difficulty down from a four to a three. And with the use of. Was it three momentum? We get two additional dice? Correct. So you right. are going to be rolling a total of four, uh, four D20 there, Dag. All right. Four successes from our lovely holographic officer. And another two from Mr. Lee. So that is a grand total of six successes, which means you get three momentum back. And what you learn is is that there are chronotons involved here. In fact, uh, and I'm going to say you could have coordinated with the ship for this, you are detecting a massive chronoton deposit, or at least a band of it, deep within the ocean. And uh, let me make sure this handout says what it <laughs> should. Yes, here it is. Uh, I'm going to give you all access to missing workers. And those workers, uh, the only note I would have to say is that the workers also include about 125 other life signs. That's about how many we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Commander, <laughs> there is a massive chroniton reading approximately 30,000 meters below the sea level. I'm reading 130 life signs, weak and fading. Uh, these readings suggest they approximately have four hours remaining before they die. Uh, it, apparently, there is <clears throat> enough electromagnetic disturbance in the atmosphere that we cannot use transporters. Can the shuttle be retrofitted to go under the water? Um, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you crazy? There's a matter-antimatter reactor in the shuttle. The sea is made out of deuterium. Antimatter plus deuterium equals planet-sized warp core breach. Certainly, our shields can be modified to protect the warp core from the deuterium. We would just remove the warp core. Yeah, yeah. Are we going to leave a warp core sitting on the ground around a refinery? Uh, I mean, we could deactivate the warp core. 
or so we, we can not transport it back to the yeah. ship. Yeah, I would say transport it back to the ship. Does the Fenrir have shuttle pods that uh, lack warp capability? It does. Worker bees? I, I did point out that we took a cheapy ship. Yeah, I would say that the shuttle you currently have is not warp capable. So you could, right. just, could just take okay. the shuttle you came in on. But how many people are can this shuttle fit? Oh, the that's probably the sticking point is best case, it can fit all of you, so you six and then maybe four more. If you okay. wanted to fit the hundred and thirty, you're gonna have to come up with something novel here. So instead of moving them, we need to alter Vol the is... conditions that they're in. <clears throat> you said that Vol's still in the room, right? Vol is still in the room, correct. Uh Vol, is there a submersible that could hold ideally 150 people give and t give or take and he, he sort of seems taken aback he's like 130 we could potentially fit that in our largest submersible yes uh, could your largest submersible go down insert depth here because I forgot 30,000 meters 30,000 meters uh, it should be rated for that depth, yes. Okay, is it rated for that depth in water, or is it rated for that depth in deuterium? Uh, in water, so I'm not, I must admit I'm not a science type, but I think it would work down there. I mean, we, uh, we sent them in that area to begin with, so. Right, but now they're sent barred. them. Well, yes, they were detect they were checking out a larger deposit a more rich deposit that's why we sent them there in the first place who did you send by the way just asking uh five workers of the snake people you were talking about hmm. could we could we borrow a submersible i would like mr rast if you could roll me a presence command Ooh, difficulty Lord. of four because I'm going to spend mm. some threat. <laughs> no. If you've got augmented ability, though, you get a free success. Yep. And I'm going to spend three of our momentum. Okay. And that's presence command. Yep. Um, focuses me? Yeah. Uh, well, I have focus of persuasion. Yep. Persuasion would be applicable. So I'm here. thinking that's going to be applicable. Mm hmm. And um, can uh, Matic uh, assist me with his glaring, um, <laughs> glaring personality? I will offer you this. The difficulty will go down to three with Matic assisting. However, if you roll, I will spend more threat to do this. If you roll a 16 to 20, there will be a complication. All right, then no. <laughs> Uh, so four, you say, huh? Mm-hmm. That four on four dice, that's going to be rough. You could potentially spend a determination here. You know, that's a good point. Yeah, I'll spend a determination. Okay. And uh, what is the value you're Let's calling see. into play? Uh... I don't have one that fits. Okay. Actually. So in that case you cannot spend determination. All right. All right. Well, here we here here goes nothing. I do get a free success, so that's helpful. Mm-hmm. May I just suggest Oh, oh wow. Oh. Wow. Okay, God. so that is seven, seven. total successes. <laughs> So, Rass, you, you don't need Matic to be a scary guy in the back. Your force of personality almost takes Vola back. He's like, oh, uh, yeah, uh, we'll go. I'll go myself and get it ready now. Thank you. How long might it take to prepare the submersible? Uh, I'm 20 minutes. We'll come with you and help. Okay, yeah, that that would that would be great. 
And yeah. Does uh, anyone want to let the captain know? Yeah, I was going to say, does does anyone come up to the ship at this point? Yeah. No. Uh, let's just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we probably should send, send a note or something. Rast, Rast will communicate to the captain. Okay. Captain, we will be... <clears throat> We are going to be taking a submersible um, to go and rescue the um, missing Azeth. Uh, Leaving out a little bit of detail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll uh, I'll take your word for it that everything will be fine. Be careful with the away team, please. Um, surprisingly, Jensen is in high spirits. We didn't go into an alternative dimension, did we? No, uh, Lieutenant Lee has quite um, a way with him. Hmm. It's a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Was that Matic? Did I hear him? <laughs> Thank you, Captain. All Click. right. <laughs> <laughs> She's lonely up there. <laughs> she has Williams. Williams. <laughs> Well, I guess they're playing cards or something. I don't know. Nice. Or unless, uh, unless, like, at some point in the conversation, you just hear, go fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, because you are... How much momentum now? Uh, your momentum should be at four. Okay. Um, but uh, since you are opting to take the submersible, um, we sort of skip the part where I would make you do... Uh, additions or modifications of the shuttlecraft. Like, you guys have chosen the easy route. Um, so, the submersible, it looks pretty much like you might expect. It's a cylinder uh, capped on both ends, runs on propeller, uh, has a crude uh, nuke reactor uh, that shouldn't set off the surrounding environment and is safe for operating in these quote-unquote waters. Um, and it's very easy to pilot. Um, it's I would say same controls as like a shuttlecraft. Um, so almost imagine a modernized, uh, what is the new class of sub they just put out? Uh, is it the Denver class? I think it is actually. Yeah. Yeah. So basically just imagine a big old Denver class, but it's modernized for 2410. And yeah, uh, we sort of have a, a montage sequence where, you launch out from the refinery and begin submerging in the waters. And for the longest time, um, as the even this, as you go down, the waves, the violent rocking of the waves uh, subsides, and eventually you get to a quote unquote stable depth, and you proceed towards the coordinates where, you know, these life signs were found, and you eventually reach uh, the set of coordinates. And I will put you on this map as I describe what you see. So when you arrive at the set of coordinates, uh, what you find is a massive crystalline structure. And the structure has within it uh, 130 individuals encased within a, uh, I believe it's a trapezoidal prism-like uh, structure. Uh, all of them are interspersed throughout this massive crystalline uh, pillar. Um, but to learn more, you would have to exit the submersible and either bring those, for lack of a better term, canisters inside, or you would have to break them open. You know, you would have to do something to warrant further information is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, did any, is anybody... So everybody on the submersible right now, is it just the six of us or are there like other members of this wherever we're at? Unless you have specifically asked or, well, let me put it this way. Unless you specifically want additional personnel, I think Vol would have just given the submersible to you six and let you run wild with it. Okay. Yeah. That's what seven successes will get you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Joy Joyride. Matic will, with Grass permission, try to modify a transporter of some kind and transport. Is it possible to transport, like, now that we're down here? Instead of trying to transport all that depth, mm -hmm. like, you know, if we pull up next to it. Or is there anything on the shuttle that could be used as, like, a mining I guess thing. A, does does the submersible have transporters? Uh, well, that was what I was going to say. Is the submersible you're in does not have transporters. 
Okay. Um, but it does have mining equipment, so you could potentially mine out all of these, uh, all of the people encased in the crystal. How long did it take us to get down here? Uh, it took you about an hour and a half, meaning that if you're keeping track of time, you have maybe three hours and 30 minutes before those life signs go kaput. So can I scan them and see how stable they <clears throat> are and maybe determine if they're being used for some kind of energy source or like why they're down here? You certainly may. That is going to be a reason medicine at a difficulty of four. Actually, it's only a difficulty of three. Yeah, difficulty of three. I'm spending a momentum. Oh, yeah. Forensic science? Mm, give me a different one. Xenovirology? Xenoimmunology, uh, prosthetics, and cybernetics? And I'm not really liking any of those, but since this is uh, an activation, you could give her a new focus. Same goes for Jensen. Oh, I have to pick one on the spot? Well, I mean, you could give him a talent. You could uh, give him an additional focus. Uh, you could give him a value if you really wanted to. Bioelectrical. Uh, <laughs> what about cryogenics? <laughs> There's parallels. I'll allow it. Okay. I'll add that as a focus. You should do bioelectric power systems so you can be like Matic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, where's my roll? Okay, that was what? Uh, reason, reason and medicine. Medicine. Okay, guys. Hmm. So that would be a total of uh, two successes, uh, which mm -hmm. is not enough to pass, unfortunately. I will offer you this. Uh, this can succeed at cost, but I will be taking some threat. Take it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think we've been pretty good at giving, not giving him too much threat this session. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, okay. I, I kind of been grasping at straws here because I only have so much threat. Um, so what you are going to learn is the following. Uh, Watney, you should now have access to Cocoon Notes. Okay. I'm just going to read this to you guys. <clears throat> All right. She's scanning like she goes up to one of the structures, the cocoons and scans up close and then starts reporting uh, inside the inside these cocoons, this, these crystalline cocoons. It's a liquid with a different mineral content than the surrounding seawater. They're alive, but they're in a coma but they're still somehow to breathe, able to breathe this material. Uh, How, sorry to interrupt, how similar is the material to latinum? So that's a liquid of some kind? Uh, I'm not sure about its comparisons to latinum, but the liquid does appear to be permeating them down to the cellular level. It's probably what's keeping them alive but removing them might kill them. It looks I like mean, it, instead of latinum, it's similar to humanoid brain patterns. Oh, great. We're dealing with another one of these. Any thoughts? Another? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, y'all weren't there for that. Want to elaborate? Uh, Chief. Uh tick tock. Long story short, fucking imagine <laughs> uh rocks that are sentient that use uh the collective knowledge of uh humans that hap that it happens to trap uh to survive, I guess. Uh it uses their uses a form of uh bioelectricity to kind of stay alive and um it doesn't necessarily feed off them it feeds off the environment itself however uh yeah these are not fun to deal with i wonder if we can somehow 
modify like a phaser to <laughs> this is where you come in <laughs> we should see we should see if uh we could potentially mine one of these cocoons out and bring it into the ship well we risk killing them well i mean it's better to test it on one than to you know just leave you know, them all to we die have to see, we have to see how difficult this will be and whether or not it's even feasible is the sensitivity fatal if we remove them from the cocoon, or if we extract the cocoon its entirety and bring it into the submersible? The yeah, I was thinking is, bringing the whole cocoon. And then release them from the cocoon itself? Once we have them inside, we could potentially get more in-depth scans and have our medical personnel see if they can figure out a way to make it a safe transition. It'll be a safer transition in here rather than out there in the in the liquid. Yeah. Is there any way that we could alter the chemical composition of the fluid in which they are currently suspended in order to give them more time or to allow them to survive longer while we continue to investigate and try to find a way to extract them without potentially risking their lives? Is that an IC or an OOC question? Both. Okay. Uh, out of character, I would say that um, you have, what did I say? Counting time here. You have about two hours and 30 minutes in which to do stuff with the cocoons. But I think what I neglected to say is that the liquid is permeating the cellular level of the workers. So if you just break the cocoons or if you try to... Uh, as I think what you're alluding to is like putting in a needle and injecting a new substance. There's a lot of unknowns here and you're sort of on the clock. So you could potentially spend more time uh, determining a counter agent, but that's maybe time you don't have at the moment. How difficult does it look like? Uh, does it look to take one of these cocoons in total and bring it onto the ship? Uh, to bring the cocoon, a cocoon, onto the ship, it would just be a control and a security at a difficulty of zero. All right, Rast is going to bring one on. Before the attempt, if I may, Commander. Yes. I would like to cross-reference my database on xenobiology and silicon-based life forms. Alil did say that there was a brain pattern in the fluid surrounding the people in the cocoons. Yeah, humanoid, a low-level humanoid brain pattern energy. The, crisp, the surrounding crystalline formations are emitting that energy, not the liquid inside. Do I feel emotion from the rock? So you open up your mind? <laughs> yes. What a question. <laughs> Rast, what you detect as you open up your mind is that that remember that presence that omnipresence mm -hmm. i was referring to it's much stronger here it's almost like you know when you're a kid you had an you maybe had an imaginary friend yeah like you could talk to them and they might respond sort of the same okay. thing here where you get the sense that you could speak perhaps mentally and you might get a response it's a very odd sensation all right. Um, he will quickly say, uh, Maddox may be correct. Wait one moment. And then I will reach out to the rock and I will ask it. Uh, we are here to rescue these people. Is there any way that we can strike an accord with you? Okay. And right at that point, we cut back to the bridge of the Fenrir. So, Captain oh, and God. Williams, oh, cues back. you have been visited in sort of that scene transition. There was a flash of light. The stereotypical Q sound has shown. And Q has emerged sitting at the con console in front of your chair, Captain Archuleta. And Q spins around and says, ah, see, now we're getting to the interesting part. Um... William, Williams pulls a phaser. Bree sets down her cards mm -hmm. and kind of like motions to Williams to like put that away a little bit. 
are like, don't be so drastic. She right. stands and tugs on her uniform and says, welcome to the Fenrir. Um, have they met? No, no they you, haven't. I, I think you may have seen her talking to Rast. Okay. But based on the Q flash and the sound, you probably know that she's a Q. Okay. So she stands, tugs on her uniform, her uniform says, welcome to the Fenrir. I assume you're a Q. You may call me Quincy if that's easier for you to dis- to differentiate between us Q. Oh, I think I could differentiate just fine. Hmm. So do you know what's actually happening down on the planet, Captain? No, I have a very fine first officer who is hopefully handling things quite well. Hmm. And oh dear, he is indeed handling it, isn't he? Well, I guess we're about to see what you and your lovely crew are made of. Do you want to be a little less cryptic? I think that'd be more fun for both of us. Hmm. Maybe fun for you, but not fun for me. She snaps her fingers. There's that uh, sound of the cue flash and she vanishes. And as we cut back to the ocean floor, uh, Rast, as you say this, uh, you get a mental sort of okay. And the entire crystalline structure begins to break apart and the cocoons begin to uh, sort of drift out of the crystal pillar and sort of hang suspended in the uh, water at this depth. However, at that same time, uh, those of you uh, that are not a part of this whole mental connection, uh, you are noticing that there is an incoming communication from the mining uh, refinery that you just came from. And the refinery message says only a few words, and those words are, it is attacking us. And I think that is where we're going to end the session for today. <gasps> All ah! right. So, ba, ba, ba. yep. So I, I was looking at the time here. I honestly think that in order to complete what's the rest of this adventure, we're going to need another two hours. And since we have a hard cutoff in, uh, in about 40 minutes, I didn't want to run over. Um, mm-hmm. So this will be a two parter. Um, we will be back unless, you know, some, uh, we'll talk scheduling with the players here in a moment off screen, but we should be back next week. Uh, so anyone watching on Twitch, YouTube, etc., uh, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you had a good time and, uh, bye stream. <laughs>